Well, kia ora e te whānau, uh, no mai, haere mai, uh, kia ora Tipani for hosting us today. Uh, ko wai au, uh, he uri au o Ngāti Parau, uh, rato ko Ngāti Kahanunu, Te Aroa, Te Atiawa, Whakatuhi, Rangatani, Tuwhari Tuo, rato. Um, I'm also Whakapapa into Gunn and Macintosh in uh, the Scottish Highlands, so I uh, always have to mention that to make mum proud. Um, and as she said, uh, I think um, I've probably got the the hardest position, not only following Aroha, but following a long day of amazing speakers covering areas from our kind of technical science and the lab work through to our applied work at place, which is always the hardest, I think, working with our whānau uh, at, on the ground, um, but also, you know, fantastic speakers like Aroha and Jessica who are working in that international space, uh, talking about what policy and legislation um, you know, means for us and how that overlaps with the work that we're all doing. So it's a really hard space to be uh, talking about seed conservation and much of what I will say today, many of you may have heard before, but I kind of want to do the high level, what got us to where we are and where we go from there as well. So I'll kind of jump up and down a wee bit in terms of what the legacies are that have created the system that Aroha was alluding to that see us where we are. So for me, and as uh, Tipani said in the introduction, I have this, you know, this idea that we need to decolonize uh, conservation, although in part we want to indigenize or re-indigenize uh, conservation because we want to take the focus off the colonization part or on the, colo uh, you know, the colonizers themselves. But conservation itself has largely benefited from this really positive image and it's seen as you know, altruistic and it's focused on helping endangered and threatened animals and plants. It's rare for people to associate it with racism and violence, but it is absolutely connected to human rights abuses, to colonization and this belief of cultural superiority that is embedded in white supremacy. And while it has been a sad week for indigenous peoples both, or weekend for indigenous peoples both here in Aotearoa and across the ditch in Australia, there are some long overdue conversations happening about the perpetuation of racism in and across society, as long as it's not done by certain right-wing parties. You know, we are talking about racism in the justice system, in sports, in movies, and in music, uh, and in governments, and even in our monarchies, but we just don't talk about it in conservation or in the environmental space. Nature uh, conservation does have its roots in colonialism and in white supremacy, and it's most evident in two spaces, which again many of you will have heard us talk about in Te Tira Whakamātaki before. The first is in this idea that humans and nature are separate things. The separation of humans and nature asserts that the wilderness and civilization are opposites and that civilization is better and more superior to nature. And it stems in part from that Christian view of the world, which elevates the importance of people over nature. But it's also kind of this widely held view um, that people are the problem. You know, overpopulation is the root cause of environmental problems. And it's a rather simplistic uh, view of the world that excuses our kind of overconsumption and our energy intensive lifestyles, especially those of wealthy countries and advanced economies. You know, where the richest 10% of the world's populations produce, you know, almost as many greenhouse gases as the bottom 90%. And it is a direct result of capitalism and colonialism. So where are we today? We're stuck in a colonial system that values economic first policies and practices that separate human well-being from the well-being of nature is important. And it believes that the creation of nature reserves, national parks, eco sanctuaries, areas devoid of people where rare animal species and plants are protected, sometimes with barriers and guards, uh, from predators that include humans is the best way to protect and restore. This is fortification conservation, and it's what Aroha is alluding to and what, in part, we hope to change with things like the reforms of the Wildlife Act. National parks across the globe have been created by removing, sometimes violently, the indigenous peoples who lived on those lands for thousands of years and often has done so to establish protected areas for game hunting. You know, similarly, many of our large conservation organisations are closely linked to those colonial, to that colonial thinking and those racist behaviours. Some of those ENGOs have issued apologies for their role in human rights abuses. Others kind of live in denial about their role 
and discriminating against Indigenous peoples. In 2019, uh, brutal violence and human rights abuses by national park rangers in several countries, including Nepal, India, Congo, and the Central African Republic, were outed by news media, particularly the use of heavily armed rangers whose military training and equipment was co-financed by WWF and who carried out violent attacks on local people, including cases of murder, torture, sexual violence, evictions, and the destruction of homes all under the guise of fighting poaching and creating eco-sanctuaries or eco-safaris. Unfortunately, this wasn't the first case of violence in the name of conservation, and WWF isn't the only Western NGO that has helped fund and cover up such human rights abuses. The entire conservation sector is guilty of human rights violence through its very creation. So it's no wonder that organisations like Extinction Rebellion are arguing that there can be no conservation without justice and no conservation without the protection of human rights and land rights. At the Fifth World Park Congress held in South Africa in 23, uh, 2003, the Indigenous delegates summed up what is a recurring problem for First Nation Indigenous peoples across the globe. And this has been reiterated a number of times, I know, by Sir Mark Solomon when he talks about the importance uh, of who getting ownership of national parks again. So this rep said, the declaration of protected areas on indigenous territories without our consent and engagement has resulted in our dispossession and resettlement, the violation of our rights, the displacement of our peoples, the loss of our sacred sites, and the slow but continuous loss of our cultures as well as impoverishment. It is thus difficult to talk about the benefits for indigenous people when protected areas have been declared on our territories unilaterally. First, we were dispossessed in the name of kings and emperors, latter in the name of state development, and now in the name of conservation. So I always say, if you want to understand the indigenous experience of conservation, those three sentences are a really good starter. The second area, and I want to go quickly through these, where we see kind of colonial links of conservation popping up, is this perpetual view that people in areas colonised are inferior in every way to their colonisers, you know, typically our white European ancestors. This view asserts that these very often uh, non-Christian cultures and their backwards and irrational idealisation of nature as a living and sentient being with its own rights are godless, wild, primitive and dangerous, perhaps not even human, and that those people need to be saved and civilised, which usually includes confiscating their lands, their languages and their culture. You know, this brutal destruction of indigenous culture is linked intimately again to Christianity. And again, I said, you know, I come from Scotland and Ireland. I'm a, my mum's an Irish Catholic girl, so this is not a bag on Christianity, but rather the way it's created the systems and structures we live under. You know, this view of, this Christian view of indigenous people though, it elevates this kind of biblical belief that we must subdue the earth and nature is an object or a resource gifted to us for our exploitation. And it kind of reinforces this view that we are the keepers and we are superior. And it downplays the importance of local people and local knowledge. And now isn't that ironic when the largest predator type animals and some of the rarest plant species that we want to protect are found in non-European, non-North American countries where the best knowledge of them comes from locals, indigenous communities. So who better to inform research and systems about protecting ecosystems and the people who live in those landscapes and have lived there for millennia. So again, if you want to understand where we are now, we are in a place where the indigenous experience of conservation is one linked intimately to racism and prejudice towards indigenous communities and their solutions, and potentially going to get worse on this side of the ditch and on the other. So how is that relevant to today's hui? Well, seed conservation also has its roots in imperialism. Botanical gardens are not just pristine sites filled with exotic plants designed to create a serene environment. They are or were once the laboratories and distribution centres for colonial powers because colonial botanists would deposit their collected, smuggled, stolen plant specimens from distant lands in those gardens for study. They used gardens to hybridise, cultivate and harvest lucrative plants from across the empire and they used them to make profit from their loot. These gardens are arguably the birthplace of cash crops and the plantation industry. Specimens and collections are also very much products of imperialism and slavery. Natural historians often sent detailed instructions to their colleagues in the colonies about what they wanted. Those colleagues relied on local knowledge and local people, often enslaved Africans or indigenous peoples, to find and collect those specimens. 
In June 2020, not long after the George Floyd murder and in the middle of our COVID lockdowns, the Royal Botanic Garden Q acknowledged their part in the legacy of colonialism and racism, noting that for more than 260 years, scientists from Q had explored every corner of the world, documenting the rich diversity of plants and fungi, seeing themselves as beacons of discovery and science, but by default, also beacons of privilege and exploitation. They not acknowledge that they took, often without permission, plants from the colonies to store, grow, propagate and sell. And to this day, they still hold, house and protect plant species that are extinct or threatened in the wild, yet sacred to people across the globe. They leaned on, I think you as well, Aroha, to help them with their decolonising process, which didn't last very long, and I think they've given up on it. Uh, so in this kind of complex past of conservation and seed collecting that come together to inform our work on seed sovereignty, for us, the current conservation laws and the seed conservation regulations created by government fail to cater for or to give effect to our rights and our needs. What we want to see is shared resourcing and decision making for our seed conservation aspirations. We expect to see new ways to practice, conserve, uh, particularly uh, seed conservation, and we want to see new practices developed and supported as methods for decolonising conservation. Practically, this means that we, uh, collectively, the we who are here, need to work together to put in place expectations. Expectations around how we see seeds being collected, how we see them being handled, and how we see them being stored. The chain of custody needs to be agreed to by mana whenua, and it needs to be resourced. To help with this, uh, Te Tira Whakamātaki has developed a statement of expectations on seed conservation. This statement, the key statements are on the screen and you can see them, uh, this statement is our line in the sand and it has nine statements uh, that articulate what we expect to see in those who are participating in seed conservation. It is a call to arms as such. It will be shared with you, the participants of this event, in the next week or so, alongside the notes from today's hui and a video recording of all the amazing presentations. Um, and we hope that you will adopt it, you will edit it, you will use it as a statement to assert your rights in the seed space and to push uh, for organisations you engage with, universities, CRI, botanical gardens, the like, uh, to understand, for them to understand your bottom lines and where you expect to be engaged. It is, as you can see, fairly obvious to us, uh, the statements are fairly obvious about Māori being recognised and respected in the chain of custody, the ongoing maintenance and attribution of our tikanga and our mātauranga. But unless we spell these out in documents that we uh, hand on uh, to agencies, then we can only ever assume uh, that they are only obvious to us, uh, that they're not necessarily obvious to those who are working with our taonga. So this is the first uh, part of our work program. It will be followed very quickly with a set of protocols. The first protocols, which should be available by the end of this year, and keep an eye on our website and on our socials, is effectively a user's guide to this statement. It tells you how to apply this at place. Um, more than anything, it tells non-Māori how to apply this and what it means uh, to us as Māori. The second set of protocols, which are uh, being designed largely by Marcus, who opened us up this morning, is about how we expect our seeds to be treated in labs. It's far more technical um, and probably, you know, designed for people like Te Aroha and Marcus than it is for someone like me. And so we are working quite strongly in the rights and interest space, as Aroha said, um, to ensure that our policy makers and decision makers are held to account in terms of what we expect to see. The other area we're working in is what I call hitangata. It's about our doing things with our people in our way. And it's we're passionate about it because we need to grow the people at place. You've heard multiple times today that we don't have enough people or we don't have enough rangatahi coming through. But it also, as Aroha said, we need networks. We need to pull together our communities so that we are sharing information. Uh, we are passing on vital uh, information about changes that might be coming through government, but also changes as, you know, Te Aroha and Waipaina would have said that we see in the environment that climate change is impacting us fast and we need to be sharing that information as well. So we're absolutely committed to growing the ability of our people to conserve our own seeds in our places. Again, as you know, many of the speakers have said, that is vital. And so uh, what we want to do is uh, share, as we've done before, our 
commitment to funding ongoing training. Uh, and Te Aroha Drummond has agreed to run training courses for the whānau of Te Tira Whakamātaki. And so we're very excited that she's agreed to do that. I know that she's going to get overrun now with requests to be on those training courses. So again, please keep an eye on our socials and that information will come out soon. Um, and we will try and get around the country so everyone has an opportunity to participate without having to travel too far. Uh, but again, our people in our places collecting seeds, not only uh, following best science practice, but following our best practices, following best practice, uh, you know, tikanga and mātauranga ahapu. I guess the other area where I personally am, am very passionate is in the infrastructure space. Again, you know, he whare taonga is the, is the phrase we use here in Te Tira Whakamātaki, and yes, we have this vision of a big national seed bank. You know, you can see a picture there of our, of our kind of um, concept of what it could look like, but we're also, and equally more importantly, committed to having infrastructure at place. We call it our hub and spoke model, this idea that it's really important to have drums everywhere and why Pina talked about the drum kits. Drum kits allow you to collect at the, you know, at home, collect in the field, um, collect wherever you want to go. You can chuck those in the back of the car, or you can take them on an aeroplane. I've done that a number of times. So drums are a really kind of quick and easy way to ensure that we're collecting at place in areas of importance where there's only one tree, as Te Aroha was telling me at lunch, you know, a seven hour paddle up the river to get to. And so our drums allow us to do that. The area where we are moving to is to try and secure these labs in a box or seed labs in a box. And the idea is to have them spread across the country as well, because equally it's important that our seeds stay close to home. Our seeds don't need to travel to the other side of the world. They don't need to go to the UK and they don't need to go to Norway. Uh, they can stay home uh, close to whānau where they are best looked after, best loved. And so the idea for us is to look for funding, uh, to look for investment, to build labs in the box and to distribute them around the country. Of course, the idea of having a national seed bank, a, a secure national seed bank that follows best practice, you know, Māori best practice is equally important, but that's kind of the fallback. That's where the science happens and that's where you send seeds if you want to. It shouldn't be the first point of call. So again, absolutely committed to building our infrastructure. And I just want to reiterate before I finish um, that Aroha alluded to the Potato Park exemplar and noted that the Potato Park was partly an exemplar because they're doing it their way. I think one of the stories that resonates with me, um, and again, Aroha and Waipaina were with me when we heard the story and why infrastructure is so important, is that we sat in a meeting many years ago uh, where we were told about an indigenous group from Thailand who had taken their seeds to an international seed bank offshore, one of the big ones that you will know of, you've seen on the news probably. And the response from the receivers at the seed bank was, it was a lot of hoopla, they came in their ceremonial dress. They had you know, very ornate um, boxes to bring their seeds in. And when they left and we opened it, there was only two seeds in there. And they kind of thought from the seed bank end that that was, uh, you know, what's the point of having them come all this way for two seeds? Whereas we were going, well, those seeds are so important. They've traveled, as Te Aroha was telling me, seven hours up the river to get those two seeds. That's all they can afford to send you. Um, and that's how important they are, is they brought them to the other side of the world for you. And so it's this dichotomy of worldviews and the way our seeds are being treated that is so important for me and why we need to get the infrastructure part right. We need to ensure our seeds, uh, as you know, Marcus alluded to at the very beginning, and it's been the theme through the speeches, are in the right environment so that their mode is protected and that we are looking after them so that they can you know, survive our future climate threats. So what's next? As I said, there are this, there's a seed statement coming. It will follow this, uh, this hui with the report. There are the seed protocols that will follow that. In-person training will kick off when Te Aroha announces that. So again, follow our socials and follow um, our website. And then we are developing online training as well. And online training will come a wee bit later in the new year. Um, but again, that'll be a series of very short courses that you can look at online and step your way through. I guess um, the other couple of things I wanted to allude to that are not tangible, I'll put my hand on right now, is this idea of decolonising conservation that we've kind of, is a bit of a theme through our kōrero. 
This idea of decolonizing conservation or re-indigenizing conservation is something that we can act on now. We can act on it, as Aroha said, through things like the Wildlife Act reform. Uh, we can act on it through what will probably become uh, public debate on GMO and gene tools. And uh, we can also act on it in terms of uh, stopping ourselves for asking for permission for everything, and we can just get going. And so our challenge at TT Dub is to just get going. And in part, I want to circle back to what Marcus was saying in the opening. You know, he talked about ecosystems being the foundation for human life. He talked about them being important for everything we do. And they are. They're not only the foundations that provide us our air, our water, our food, our fibre, as we've said many times, but they're also, you know, nature's ecosystems are also the spaces where we get many of our social experiences. They provide us with things that are vital to living, living our lives in full ways. If you think about your life, many of your most memorable experiences have been in nature, whether that's camping or fishing or attending a wedding in a really cool space, your picnics, you're going to the beach. All of those things are services that nature provides us for free. So we depend on nature for our very existence. And I think we keep forgetting that. And our governments keep forgetting that. And we elect governments that forget that without nature, we don't exist. We are very close to eco uh, ecosystem collapse. In fact, in some places we have gone over and we have, uh, we have seen systems collapse, especially as Waipaina talked about in spaces where middle rust is rampant. Ecological collapse across the globe will not only lead to environmental destruction, but it will lead more importantly to social and economic uh, collapses. We see those in spaces where we are facing uh, conflict. We see uh, ecological changes that impact whole communities to the point where they have to move to new nations. So what we're also going to see with climate change is an increase in resource-based conflicts. We have a small amount of time to get it right. We've spent the last 30 years debating how to even measure biological and biodiversity, uh, you know, collapse. We have measures that have been put in place, I think, since the Rio summit, which would have been over 30 years ago, and not one of those measures, one of those biodiversity measures, has been met. We are not in a political climate to address climate change right now, or anymore, and so this is very much an issue that we as Indigenous people, we as scientists, as researchers, as communities of practice who care about the environment and care about our seeds, have to step up and we have to take charge and start asking, uh, stop asking for permission and just do. So I guess my closing remarks are that as TT Dub's byline says, uh, we are committed to indigenous solutions for a better world. We genuinely believed that not only will we find solutions at the nexus of kind of science uh, and policy and social research, but we will find it only if we invest in indigenous communities and indigenous solutions. So please, uh, use this as an opportunity to connect, to talk, to share what you're doing at place uh, via Michael's map, and to ensure that we carry on with these conversations so that collectively we can protect our environment uh, and progress with the solutions that we know we're going to need that may be hard in the next three years to get over the line. Um, I'll leave it there and hand it back to you, Tipani. Ora, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koe, meal. Pretty sobering way to if end the day. <laughs> Kia ora. We do have a question. Someone's got the courage to ask you a question. How about that? In, in your opinion, what career or skill sets do rangatahi need to enable them to make mokopuna decisions within the current landscape? Oh, Adrian. Oh, good old Adrian. Um, well, let me go a roundabout way. When I was... When I was lecturing at Lincoln University, and Adrian probably has heard me say this before, one of the things I would reiterate to students and summer students was that every job I've ever had has been created for me. It's the first job that, of its type. So I don't think nowadays you can necessarily train for a job. I think you have to learn skills uh, and transferable skills that you can use in whatever's going to come next. I think that the most important thing we can teach our kids is to love and connect to nature, to rebuild that reciprocal relationship with Papa Tuanuku that many people talked about, um, but also to, criti to be critical thinkers. 
uh, and to investigate and not just believe everything they see and hear. And I think many people have alluded to that, especially when it comes to things like GMOs and gene editing. Um, there, are, there are scientists out there with um, vested interests who may tell us that the science says one thing, but many of us know it doesn't. So critical thinking is going to be key uh, to ensure that we are making decisions that are future focused. Kira, thanks for that. Fano, uh, any other questions? Uh, well, on that note, um, thanks, Mal, and, and uh, thank you for the work that you do in many fora and holding uh, everybody in the corridor to account. We do have. Uh, <laughs> this is from your son. <laughs> what's for dinner? No. I, lo I love you. I love you, Mum. What's for dinner? No. <laughs> uh, are there avenues out there for private funding or does this just create different issues? Uh, yes and yes. So I think private funding does create other, in, other issues potentially if you don't have value alignment. Um, you could, you know, there's the, the view that you could be being bought, there's the view that they may want to and, you know, have a say in what you do. Um, I think, though, uh, on the whole, that our best avenue for escaping, um, I guess, the crown control uh, and escaping that vicious political cycle of three years of, you know, up and down, yes, we support Māori, no, we don't support Māori, yes, we want to support the environment, no, we don't, is to go for private funding. And I personally believe that we are seeing a, a huge swing to support environmental kaupapa and to support best practice in terms of... Um, reducing waste and reducing emissions across the globe uh, and we will see more interest I think from big corporates who want to not only greenwash because that's always a risk but will want to start doing the right thing for their grandchildren so I think it's where we're going to have to go yeah Kia ora, thank you Hopefully.